Okay, good morning. Um, my name is Maria Keeney and I'd like to wa warmly welcome you to our webinar this morning. I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague, Professor Mead Brennan, who's going to discuss governance in a post-COVID world. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about Neve. Uh, Professor Neve Brennan is Michael McCormick Professor of Management at UCD and Founder and Academic Director of the UCD Centre for Corporate Governance. Neve qualified as a Chartered Accountant with KPMG, holds a PhD from the University of Warwick and is a Chartered Director of the Institute of Directors in London. In recognition of her research, Neve was elected to the Royal Irish Academy in 2020, Ireland's highest academic honour. Indeed, she was the first uh, business school academic to be recognised. Neve also received the 2018 British Accounting and Finance Association Distinguished Academic Award and was inducted into the Interdisciplinary Accounting Research Hall of Fame in 2019. Former chair of the National College of Art and Design and of the Dublin Docklands Development Authority, she holds and has held non-executive directorships with the Children's Hospital in Ireland, the Health Service, Service Executive, Ulster Bank, Co-Operation Ireland, Quiltcha, Lifetime Assurance and several private companies, and is a member of many audit committees. She chaired the Irish Government's Commission on Financial Management and Control Systems in the Health Services and was Vice Chair of the Irish Government's Review Group on Auditing. Neve is also an inaugural honorary fellow of the Institute of Directors of Ireland and an honorary fellow of the Society of Actuaries in Ireland. I'm going to be back with you at the end of the presentation to put any questions that you have to Neve, so please do include them in the chat below and we'll try and get through as many as possible. I'll also be discussing our upcoming professional diploma in corporate governance, which is starting in September, which is in its 16th year. Um, I noticed in the registrations this morning that there's a lot of uh, alumni from the programme um, here for the webinar, so that's great to see. Any of you would like to discuss your experience on the programme, um, we'd be delighted to let you speak, so maybe just put your name in the chat and we can call you at the end. All right, well, without further ado, I will hand you over to Neve, and as I say, I'll see you again at the end of the presentation. Thanks so much. Thanks, Neve. Thanks very much, Maria. Um, so I'm going to uh, just share my screen. Okay, um, good morning everybody and um, welcome to this little uh, presentation. And as Maria said, I'm really delighted to see so many uh, graduates of the Diploma in Corporate Governance, people that I would now see call my friends. Um, and lovely to have you here on the call this morning. And of course, lovely to have some uh, new people on the call as well. So um, this presentation uh, is kind of maybe slightly random thoughts on corporate governance um, in a post-COVID world. Um, I, I've just finished writing a paper on um, COVID-19 profit warnings. And I uh, footnoted in the paper, and this is going to be for the pub quizzes of the future. What does the acronym COVID stand for? Um, and uh, it's, uh, it stands for CO Corona VI Virus D Disease uh, 2019. Um, and it's called Corona uh, Virus because it has a kind of like a crown um, effect uh, the virus has. Anyway, um, on to corporate governance and um, the what's called ESG, Environment, Society, Governance Agenda. A strange thing about the ESG agenda is that you might have expected COVID to knock that agenda off its perch, but funnily enough, I have a feeling that the ESG agenda is actually become stronger than ever. Um, and as recently as yesterday, and a very experienced non-executive director phoned me and he said to me, you know, Neve, he said, there is a huge appetite out there for people with qualifications in the area of sustainability. And he said, you should add to your uh, pro, uh, to your fleet of offerings, you should add 
a diploma in sustainability. There's an appetite for people having that qualification at board level. And in speaking with my colleagues this morning, there's probably an appetite also at executive level for that kind of expertise. But anyway, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some cases that went wrong during COVID. I re I'm really interested in corporate governance failure because I think by examining failure, um, you can learn from failure. Um, I uh, This year for my MBA in corporate governance, if because of COVID, um, asking them to do an end of semester exam wasn't really appropriate, I felt. So instead of an end, end of semester exam, I asked the students to write um, a 5,000 word essay on the anatomy of a corporate governance failure. And some of the uh, assignments the students wrote were absolutely knockout. Um, especially a few students who wrote about their own organization. There was one person in the class, for example, who worked in Tesco when Tesco dropped its quarter of a billion uh, bombshell on the market in 2014. And uh, that MBA student wrote about being in Tesco uh, during that event. It was absolutely fascinating. But we can learn uh, about corporate governance by looking at failure. And um, just again, the kind of COVID context and we're coming out of COVID. My own feeling is that um, there is a heightened sense that people want more fairness out there than ever before. So people want a society that is fair. And just to remember during COVID, healthcare workers died to take care of us. Older people died because the handling of uh, COVID, particularly in the earlier months, wasn't as good as it should be. And they were moved. Uh, into homes which were not safe from a COVID point of view. Younger folk suffered. Um, they had their education. Uh, they missed six months of education um, and their social life has been put on hold. So a lot of people suffered. People died. You couldn't go to funerals, etc. You couldn't see people um, in hospital or in homes. And I think that that has heightened a want of fairness in organizations. So looking at some failures, um, here's one. And this was where um, the Beacon Hospital had vaccines left over. So they uh, gave them to 20 teachers in a private school, St. Gerard's in Bray. And so those teachers got a, jumped ahead of the queue and St. Gerard's in Bray was picked because the CEO of Beacon Hospitals, children went to that school. Um, and uh, interestingly, and, and you know, it didn't pass my test. And it's a really simple test. And the test is, if you read about this on the front page of the Irish Times, what would people think? And to me, I don't go to rules and regulations and laws. Uh, to find out, you know, uh, does, is this right? I just think about what would people react? How would they react if they saw it on the front page of the Irish Times? And again, this sense of fairness in a COVID and post-COVID world, people reacted very negatively because they just didn't feel it was fair. Um, and interestingly, the board appointed retired uh, Arthur Cox, Solicitor's Managing Partner, Eugene McCaig, to investigate. And I find it quite uh, interesting that the Beacon Hospital has suffered consequences from this. The first is that its key stakeholder, the HSE, removed it as a vaccination centre. And then secondly, notwithstanding the board undertaking to have its own investigation by Mr McCaig, the HSE picked um, Cornelia Stewart, a retired HSE official, to conduct an investigation. And that would suggest a certain lack of trust in the uh, investigation that the Beacon Hospital said it was conducting. Um, so 
it was in a way a small event, 20 vaccines given to people to jump the queue. But it has had, I think, some quite significant uh, effects for the Beacon Hospital, especially damaging its relationship with the HSE, which would be a key stakeholder. Um, here's another uh, story in the Financial Times this week, JD Sports. And there's been a significant investor backlash um, because of the proposal to pay the executive chairman, Peter Cowgill, pictured there, 4.3 million bonus pounds, GB pounds. And the, they're proposing this at the annual general meeting, which is coming up on the 1st of July. The problem is that JD Sports took millions from the UK government, 61 million under the furlough scheme, and it received 38 million under the business rates relief scheme. And so the shareholder advisory group, Glass Lewis, has urged investors uh, to vote against uh, this proposal, which uh, Glass Lewis has called an inappropriate pay policy. And again, at the heart of that is a question of fairness. The company took taxpayers' money and is now proposing to give 4.3 million to its executive chairman. Another feature of COVID, and again, we're coming out of it, and again, it came up recently with Lloyd's. Um, at three days notice, Lloyd's changed its plans um, in relation to attendance at its um, annual general meeting and um, saying that it would allow 100 people to attend the AGM. Uh, and again, I think it was in the Financial Times reported that 10 small investors traveled to the AGM in Edinburgh on the, in the 20th of May. Again, a far cry from the large crowds that might have turned up uh, before the pandemic. And Lloyd said that it moved quickly when the lockdown restrictions were lifted because it recognized how important AGMs are for shareholders. But that raised a kind of a troubling aspect of AGMs during the pandemic. AGMs are very important um, forums for investors uh, and for accountability where investors can ask questions of the board. Um, and during um, COVID, companies stopped having AGMs, which disenfranchised shareholders from asking questions and from the accountability process. And regulators and shareholders were concerned about that. And the thing that I could never work out was, why couldn't AGMs be held virtually? Um, everything else was being held virtually, so I couldn't really understand why companies could not allow shareholders to attend AGMs um, virtually. And um, continuing with kind of governance issues, um, of course, pre-COVID, during COVID, post-COVID, we will always have the usual suspects. So here is the usual suspects. Um, and this organization has been hitting the headlines for absolutely the wrong reasons. The founder, Peter Ayrton, and the successor CEO, David Maloney, have taken about maybe uh, approximately 800,000 euro from this charity. And the way they did it was they falsified donations to charity projects. So they claimed that they had donated the money to a charity, let's say in Africa, where in fact uh, the money had gone to themselves. And the recipients uh, of the donations have now come forward and said they never got the money. Um, and um, this, this is, I think, a very sad case. Um, it's led to uh, Mr. Ayrton, uh, unfortunately, taking his own life. It's also very damaging for the charity sector. There is a contagion effect on other charities when something like this happens. And I think it's also very disheartening for the farming families that 
engaged so much in this. Uh, it was a great idea, actually, of of the of Mr. Arton, um, and I think that the farming families that um, engage with this charity, I think, must be pretty gutted um, at what has happened. Um, again. Another governance story this week has been the collapse of Stobart Air. Um, and again, um, the risk of insolvency is extremely heightened during COVID. Um, and the problem with taking on a directorship, a company directorship, is it is very risky. And uh, this was not a good day for the directors of Stobart Air. Um, and these events, a lot of the company collapses are because the directors have done a bad job. But in this case, uh, this was just a risk that hit this sector so hard. But it's not a great item on your CV to have been a director of a company that went in, into liquidation. Um, so um, the coronavirus is risky for company directors personally. Um, and um, the question, if you're a director of a company suffering during COVID, the question is, do you try and keep the company going? And if you try and keep the company going, are you at risk of being um, charged with reckless trading? Um, and reckless trading is where a board keeps a business going when they know the business uh, cannot pay the, its debts as they fall due. And um, when a company approaches insolvency, directors' duties, which are normally to the company, shift a bit. And uh, instead of having to look after the company's interest, they have to pay particular attention to creditors' interests. Um, and if, if directors are found guilty of reckless trading, they will be prosecuted. They may be prosecuted and they may be restricted by the courts from acting as a company director. Um, not a great uh, thing to have on your CV. So the Office of the Director of Corporate Enforcement um, issued a note on insolvency and COVID-19. Um, when a company goes into liquidation, liquidators are required to uh, uh, or may be required to apply to the High Court to have directors restricted. And uh, so they must bring uh, this to the High Court unless the Office of Director of Corporate Enforcement uh, grants them uh, relief for to not doing so. And relief will be granted um, to if directors are considered to have acted responsibly and honestly. And I wrote a case uh, which I trialed uh, in the Diploma in Corporate Governance over five years, and it was published um, in uh, uh, March. Um, but um, the case concerns a Irish company, Pierce Contracting, and the liquidator wasn't given relief by the Office of the Director of Corporate Enforcement and brought uh, the directors of Pierce Contracting to court. And um, for those on the call who would like to know what happened, uh, you have to join, sign up to the next year's class where I uh, run that case uh, to find out what happened next. But um, I wouldn't be sleeping easy in my bed uh, because the, of the ODCE's guidance. The ODC has a lot of power to request liquidators to take directors to the High Court. Uh, so uh, this is not uh, an easy situation for company directors who are suffering from COVID. Um, so um, just to go back and talk about the UCD diploma in corporate governance. And um, it brings together, of course, the rules and regulations. And there are legal rules and regulations and there are codes of best practice. But I think a big strength of the programme is that it also deals with the behavioural and psychological issues. And it's these kind of aspects that explain events like BOHER, for example. It's not the rules and regulations, it's the human behavioural side. 
Um, and what we try to do in the program is to sensitize uh, participants to the very complex gray areas around corporate governance. Um, and uh, as is in the news today and yesterday, uh, we will be back face to face in September um, and uh, really looking forward to that. Um, so those are the few words I have to share with you today. Um, and I don't know whether there are any um, questions in the chat room, but I'll stop sharing my slides now. Great, thank you, Nibia. Yeah, there's a few questions coming in here, so um, I will um, I'll start reading through them. And if you want to keep adding them as, as we go, um, uh, if any of the attendees have any more. Uh, so one a specific one, would you have any advice for directors, specific advice for directors in the credit union sector? Um, there is absolutely no doubt that um, governance plays out differently in different types of organisations. And that is one topic that is covered on the programme. And um, what people who have not been a company director don't fully understand is that boards in law always have 100% responsibility, but may not have 100% uh, autonomy to do what they want to do. A very good example of such a board is a state board. So you're 100% responsible if you're on a state board, but you are, your hands are tied behind your back and possibly your feet are tied, tied behind your back as well, because you have to comply with government policy. So the things you'd like to do to govern well, you actually can't do. In a family business, there may be a dominant patriarch or founding matriarch, which again maybe constrains the board's ability to govern in the way that the board would like to. And even in listed companies, um, there, if there's a large shareholder, um, you know, the board may not be free to govern in the way that uh, it should govern. In relation to the credit union sector, um, I would have thought that credit unions, you know, would have a good bit of autonomy to run the credit union as they see fit. Uh, it's a highly regulated sector. I think that is a big challenge for that sector. Uh, they, they also have a rather unusual feature, which is they have an oversight committee overseeing the board, uh, um, which, which is a, a little bit unusual. Um, so um, I think that the highly regulated nature of credit unions is what sets it apart uh, and financial institutions generally. Um, but I do think that the board is free to govern properly. Okay, great. And um, here's one here. How, how important is diversity on a board? And a follow on from that, um, you know, what are the participants, what's the participant mix on the diploma and corporate governance? And is it a, a diverse group? Um, well, diversity is often characterized down to things like gender. Um, I don't myself see diversity as a gender issue. I think it's about different ways of thinking. Um, and um, the mix in the class, and this happens naturally, we don't uh, organize this ourselves, um, but a great strength of the diploma and corporate governance classes is the extraordinarily wide range of expertise within the student body. And a distinguishing feature of executive education is peer-to-peer -peer learning. So yes, you learn something from the lecturers, but you will learn at least, I would say, half of what you learn is um, from your classmates. So having that diversity, and I'll just give you, for example, we had a former ambassador to, uh, 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 to Japan, did the program a couple of years ago. We had a pediatric cardiologist did it a couple of years ago. So you'd be absolutely amazed at the range of expertise that um, comes into the classroom. Um, 
I've just finished my own third exec ed diploma in Smurfit this year. And I'm now going to be getting a master's in uh, coaching. If you do three of the diplomas, you can get a master's. It's a marvelous bit of cross-selling organized by my colleagues in Smurfit. But uh, this year's course was on uh, team coaching. So in one of my assignments, and I'm now working it up as a paper in an academic journal, but in one of my assignments, um, I asked the question, is the board of directors a team? And in the prior literature, um, you know, there is quite a bit of emphasis on the board of directors working as a team. The literature is a little bit conflicted because sometimes some of the academics say there's two teams. There's the board team and then there's the executive team. So there's a bit of confusion in the literature as to whether a, a board um, is a team. And then you have the problem that if the board is really working brilliantly as a team, does that risk the board suffering from groupthink? And the whole diversity agenda for boards is to try and stop that groupthink, to make the boardroom a somewhat more uncomfortable place, less likely for groupthink to take uh, place. Um, rather than it being the cosy uh, club, old boys club or whatever. Um, so the emphasis on diversity is to try and address the groupthink problem that uh, afflicts boards. Great. Um, okay, there's lots of questions coming in here. Let me think. Um, what advice uh, would you give someone starting out on a board in the charity sector? Um, Besides to do the programme. Well, apart from doing the programme, well, I, I just say don't make the mistake I made on my first board appointment. I talked far too much. And um, in, my, in my dream scenario, I'd love to be the board member who asks, who gets to the kernel of asking the right questions, the really important questions to the board and um, not to speak too much. And again, from my first year of the coaching, one of the things that you learn in coaching is you learn to listen. And I began to practice that on some of the boards that I'm on. And I found that by saying less and by listening more, I actually got more attention from my fellow board members. So my, my influence in the boardroom improved by listening more and saying less and disciplining myself to try and focus in on the really key issues. But for the person who asked about uh, joining a charity board, um, you know, I think the charity sector is quite high risk because um, it doesn't have the funding to splash out money on governance and accounting and all those kind of things. So it is a high risk um, assignment. And I'd say to whoever is joining a charity board, you know, be, be very careful. Make sure everything is being done properly. Great. And this is, I suppose, is a, an interesting segue. Someone's asking, uh, Liam Garvey's asking, do we have too many registered charities? Should they have a time limit? Um, that's a that's a kind of tricky question. Um, by the way, it does come back to the credit union question, which is the first question, mm -hmm. because there is a very strong um, pressure being put on the credit union sector for amalgamation, because with the increased cost of compliance that is being imposed by the central bank on financial institutions, you know, small credit unions really, um, you know, struggle. So they are being pressurized into amalgamate. Um, you know, the charity sector is really difficult because, you know, people establish charities with the very best of intention. You know, they've suffered a bereavement or whatever, and they want to honor the person uh, that has passed away or whatever, you know, so it would be very draconian to be saying, no, no, you can't set up a charity. You know, you have to do this, you have to do that. Mm -hmm. So um, um, I do think it, as a sector, it's improving. I think the charity regulator 
has done a very, very good job um, in, in, in improving the sector. And also a graduate of the Diploma in Corporate Governance, Patricia Quinn, after she did the Diploma in Corporate Governance, she set up an organization called Benefax, and that operates in the charity sector. And if you cannot find a financial statement for a charity, you'll find it on her website. She just did a fabulous job in the charity sector. So as a sector, it's improved. But Liam, I'm not so sure that it would be appropriate to go so far as to be saying to people, no, 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 you can't set up a charity or you have to merge with some other charity. Right. Um, and um, how do you deal with long serving dominant board members who are on a membership based charity? whom are holding back progress in governance of the organisation? That is a very serious risk for an organisation and it is very often at the heart of why eventually it ends up as governance failure. And um, the first thing is, if you're on a board, you really need to have a board terms of reference. And again, if you sign up to the Diploma in Corporate Governance, that is, that is one of the assignments uh, in my course, in my audit committee course, one of the assignments is to get uh, the class in groups to prepare a corporate governance document like a board terms of reference, audit committee terms of reference, whistleblowing policy, et cetera. But um, I always say to a board, you know, have you got a terms of reference? Oh, no, no, we have the constitution or the memo and articles. Well, the memo and articles stroke constitution is far, far too high level a document. Um, it needs, a board terms of reference needs to be a little bit more detailed. And the board terms of reference should have a tenure for directors. And um, if you take the UK corporate governance code, which applies to listed company, um, the, uh, appropriate tenure is two three-year terms at a stretch a third three-year term and once you've hit the nine years you're gone your sell by date and what that means is you actually don't have to leave the board but um, the best practice would be that you would not be qualified to be uh, classified as independent if you have served more than nine years, you can stay on the board, but not be one of the INEDs, the independent non-executive directors. So in relation to the membership organization, uh, at the back of that question, I think that that organization needs to bring in term limits for its board. Um, that's how to address that problem. Okay, great. Um, this sort of touch, touches on something you covered in the um, presentation about um, company, uh, being a director of a company that goes into an examership. So uh, Michael says, as we know, many startups fail. My understanding for executive directors and companies entering examinership is that they cannot seek new employment throughout this process. Is this the case or is there other options? Um. I'm, I, I don't know the answer to that question, to be honest. Um, uh, I, I mean, examinerships can go on for a very long time. So I would have thought that it would be very draconian to say to somebody who's been an executive director of a company that's gone into examinership that they cannot find employment elsewhere for as long as the company's in examinership. But I don't actually know technically the answer to that question. I apologize that I don't know the answer. That's fine. Um, someone's asking, what's the title of the master's degree upon completion of the three diplomas? So you get a, a master's in business, leadership and management practice if you do three of the diplomas. And um, then, uh, Neve, the one you did was a master's in coaching you receive at the end, the one that you mentioned. Yeah, well, I did I did my three diplomas in, a, in, in one uh, domain area. So I did three years of coaching of one type or another. Um, I know that some other people have a more eclectic mix of the diplomas, so they wouldn't at the end be able to call it, you know, a master's in coaching. And I think, uh, Carol, I think, Maria, you've given the official title. It's an MSc in... In, in business leadership and management practice, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, this probably touches on what you were talking about earlier about sustainability, but what new skills and experience would you like to see on the board in the future? Um, 
Well, um, I have to say, I'm not a great fan of, you know, um, people in marketing always say you need, you should have an expert in marketing on the board. People in HR say, oh, you should have a HR expert on, on the board. Um, another kind of uh, request is that you have, let's say, somebody with IT expertise. Um, I'm a bit more agnostic on that um, because I kind of wonder, does it misunderstand that the role of the board is to govern, whereas um, the role of management is to manage. So I don't, I'm not convinced that you have to have every management specialty on the board uh, because management is management's job. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I, I do think that, uh, I do think that some kind of, you know, financial expertise, at least one or two board members should have financial expertise. For example, again, best practice suggests that uh, at least one member of the audit committee have financial expertise, and that would be maybe a professional qualification in accounting. Um, I mean, that would be that would be the only one that I think is essential. Um, 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 and I, I just, I, again, I, I think that what you need on a board is a group of people that have an appetite for the business to be up run in the right way. Um, I'd also think, and we discovered this at the banking crisis, that I think uh, expertise in the industry in which the company is operating is, is important. Um, now, not everybody has to be uh, expert in the industry on the board. Not everybody on the board has to be a professionally qualified accountant, but I think you have to have those kind of skills um, uh, represented on the board. Um, I'm going to uh, express my, um, put on my cynical hat, which I find very hard to take off, to be honest, <laughs> in relation to the question I got yesterday about having sustainability expertise on the board. You know, I wonder, is that a little bit of kind of greenwashing? You know, do boards want it to look as if they're being sustainable? And are they in substance? You know, so, you know, um, again, uh, there's a great phrase called a trophy board. So a lot of boards have people with titles on them, Lord this, Dame that, Baroness the rest, you know, and these are called trophy boards. And is having the sustainability a trophy on a board or is it something really meaningful and substantive? Okay, very interesting. And uh, Neve, uh, interesting, I can see here there's actually a lot of people asking when our sustainability course is coming in Smurfit Executive Development, so you've thrown the cat among the pigeons. But we uh, we are, uh, we just spoke about it this morning, actually, uh, myself, uh, Neve, and Caroline. So we are looking into it and we, we will keep you posted on any programs coming down the track on sustainability. Um, here's, uh, we've, there's loads of questions coming in, so I'll try maybe just to ask two more and um, then we'll discuss the Diploma in Corporate Governance. So here's one from Mark. What, what do you think is the number one um, failure, corporate governance failure by Irish companies? Um, it, it's, you know, Failure, it, what's amazing about corporate governance failure is how so many mechanisms of governance fail at the same time. It doesn't fail because one thing goes wrong. It fails because 10 things go wrong. So if you take the big failure of um, last year, which is Wirecard, the German uh, card payment company, you know, uh, the, you know, uh, arguably there was failure by the external audit. There was failure by Baffin, the German regulator. Obviously board failure, obviously uh, management failure. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the chief executive described his personality, Marcus Brown, he described his personality as he was a pathological optimist. 
that definitely contributed to the failure. So it's not really easy to pick out one thing, but in my opinion, the failure comes down to the people. So the German regulator, Baffin, the people, the individuals in the regulator turned a blind eye to all the whistleblowing that the Financial Times was revealing. The external auditors, or EY, uh, just turned a blind eye to many, many red flags, including, as it now turns out, its own partner. So uh, the forensic accountant accounting partner was raising issues and the audit partners were ignoring it. Um, again, the management, the board. So to me, the number one failure is always down to people not doing their job properly, turning blind eye to incredibly obvious red flags. Um, and this leads on nicely to our discussions on the programme. So um, someone's asked here, what do you hear most from participants having completed the programme? What kind of key takeaways surprise you? Um, quite a few uh, of the graduates have said the following to me. And again, some of the people that sign up um, already have very considerable experience as directors. And at the end, they say, you know, Neve, I was surprised at how much I learned that I didn't expect to learn. These are people who come in feeling there's so much experience, they have nothing else to learn. They just like the qualification. Um, and I think what the strength of the programme is, because there's lots of, lots of other competitor programmes, but what I, I think the real strength of the programme is the depth in which we go into everything. And the way in which we marry extremely practical material with the academic material. And um, that just gives it a, a tremendous depth. And so I'm always pleased when people, experienced people say, you know, I learned so much uh, from it. And I think um, the other thing that people kind of say is how much they learned from each other in the class. Um, that's a, a, a big learning as well. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for that, Neve. Um, I'm I'm just going to talk a little bit about, bit about the program, and um, hopefully you'll be able to stay with us to give them a bit more in depth knowledge on what happens uh, within the program. Um, so, so the, the diploma in corporate governance is starting um, in September 2021. So we're accepting applications um, from now. Um, I'll just get we, we can see details of the program. Pardon. We can't see your screen, um, Maria. Oh, can you not? Oh, sorry. It says that you started screen sharing, but uh, it's not. Oh, thanks for letting me know. Um, I don't know why it's not coming up there. Neve, you wouldn't mind sharing yours, would you? I think they're on your slides too. Maybe I don't have no the problem. Yeah. Sorry, uh, hold on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Right. Just on to, thanks so much, Neve. Um, so, um, as you know, so the program is led by Professor Neve Brennan, who you've heard from today, and it's starting on the 6th of the set, September 2021. It's on every Tuesday and uh, Monday and Tuesday evening from 4.30 to 7.30 p.m. And um, there's also um, included in the program two weekends away where you cover a full module in a weekend, but also get to bond with your class at a hotel in Ireland. And um, so as Neve uh, mentioned during her presentation, um, the program will take back, play, place back on campus uh, in Smurford Executive De Development. So we're, we're delighted to be welcoming uh, new and old executives back to our campus. Uh, the fees are 15,325 or else if you're a UCD business alumni, you're entitled to a 5% discount. So these can be paid either in full at the start or else broken into four installments throughout the year, if that makes it easier. Uh, Neve touched on it in her presentation. So, so we have like 25 to 30 people uh, within the class um, and they represent a range of industries from both the public and private sector. Uh, so each, each cohort is mature and experienced, um, and as Neve um, said, you will learn as much from your peers as from the lecturers in the classroom. 
Um, so I just see a question coming in. Um, no, uh, we're go we're definitely going to be back face to face, so you can't attend remotely. Um, it will ju be just in class, and um, there's not going to be a hybrid option. Um, in terms of the content, um, I think Neve covered this in her presentation as well, but you see a full list of the modules there. Um, may Neve, maybe you'd like to speak a little more about um, the content of the program. And what um, well, the, the content uh, attempts to kind of cover. Um, um, all of the key areas that you would need to know about if you're serving on a board. Um, now, if you take, for example, so it starts off, I deliver the first course, the overview. We then go into regulations. So the next three courses are about the regulations. Then there, we've, we're into the behavioral aspects. Uh, director remuneration, um, that would be mainly orientated to people who are on publicly listed companies. Then we have the uh, financial reporting, uh, a very significant role for boards. Then we have the uh, board committee, the audit committee. Uh, the, the remuneration topic uh, covers the uh, compensation committee. And then the selection of non-executive directors uh, uh, will um, uh, cover the uh, committee of the board that uh, exercise that function. Then we have risk management and then finally you know it is a board of directors so a key role of the board is strategy so the last two courses uh, are on strategy and then the role of the board in improving uh, business performance. Okay, great. Um, so I, I suppose just finally today, that just gives you a, a short snippet into the course, but if any of you would like to um, contact me directly after the webinar, my contact details are there. I'll also be sending you all an email today um, with my contact details and also a recording of the webinar in case you want to um, either watch it back or share it with your colleagues. And um, that's just a picture of our campus there, just to show you that we're you know, really looking forward to getting back on campus. And um, I know I see some of you in the chat me mentioning the possibility of online courses in, in Smurfit Executive Development, and we are looking into this at the moment. So we will share details as soon as we know more. I just say, Maria, can I just yes. um, say there, yeah. um, you know, um, in my opinion, it is not possible to have proper peer-to-peer -peer learning. And the peer-to-peer -peer learning takes place when you're uh, going into the classroom waiting for the lecture to start. There's a break in the middle of each lecture and we go up to the dining room and we have a, a, a meal, uh, evening meal and, and, a, and a cuppa um, and at the end of the class. And we, we, we were online this year and it worked as well as it could have worked being online, but the students in this year's class did not have the full peer-to-peer -peer learning experience uh, that you would have with face-to-face. Um, -face. Um, and I think that there is a growing recognition and acknowledgement that, you know, education does require people to actually meet up, chat, um, gossip and all the rest, things that really you can't do on Zoom. So this year's class were absolutely fantastic in the positive way they approached the necessity of uh, doing the course online. Um, uh, you know, and they, they really made the very best of it. But it is a suboptimal option, in my opinion. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And, 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 you know, as I say, you know, we're delighted that we're coming, uh, going to be back in September and I think it was almost this time last year, Neve, you did a webinar for us and it was um, governance during COVID. So it, it feels good to be sort of at this side of it, even though I know we have a, a little way to go. Um, but look, look, that's a, a nice way to finish today. And I just want to thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, and thank you so much, Professor Neve Brennan, for giving up your time and um, answering all the questions today. And look, have a, have a lovely rest of the day and, and we hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Thanks, Neve.